All right, tonight, um, then there is a handout back there. Um, if anybody needs it, grab it as you go out. But we'll, we'll go over the whole thing up here. Eli does not like it when I start talking. Um, I always talk about him. Uh, we're going to play off that statement that Paul made in Acts 27, verse 25, when he said, For I believe God just as it was told to me. Uh, if you remember the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 27, Paul was aboard a ship, lost at sea. He was aboard that ship as a prisoner on his way to Rome, and a very bad storm arose. And then in verses 18 through 20, Luke, who was aboard the ship with Paul as a fellow passenger, um, wrote this. It says, And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. Uh, and on the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now when neither sun nor stars uh, appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. So we see this ship. Uh, verse 37 tells us that there are 276 men aboard this ship, and these men were scared for their very lives. Yeah, so they were in a survival situation. In verse 21, Paul alludes to the previous warning that he had given them uh, before taking off. The text says this, it says, But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them in the ship and said, Men, well, I like Paul for this. You should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must go, you must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. So, through the angel sent from God, what did God reveal to Paul by his all-knowing and all-powerful hand? Paul, there will be a shipwreck, and this ship will be destroyed, but not one soul aboard this ship is going to die. But those men who chose to believe Paul's message, I'm sure that they would have uh, been supplied some comfort if they chose to trust that he was telling the truth. And it seemed that many of them did after the story was over. Uh, but surely some thought amongst themselves when they heard this promise, they said, I don't believe this man. And that's not written in the scripture, but surely there was some doubt. How can this man know the future? But of course, if you continue reading that chapter, we read that just as God had told Paul, uh, the thing that was foretold came to pass precisely as it had been spoken to Paul. Uh, not one passenger on that ship died in the shipwreck of all 276 souls aboard. So the verse that we're focusing on for our theme tonight is verse 25, when Paul is revealing this information beforehand, uh, and he says, not one man will die on this ship, uh, from this shipwreck. And then here's the wording of verse 25. Paul says, therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told to me. And that's the attitude I want us to learn from tonight and learn to say for ourselves. I believe God. I believe God that it will be just as he's spoken it to me. You know, since time began, a lot of people have come across the words of God. God has spoken in times past in various ways. And men who hear them deemed them impossible or unbelievable what God would speak in times past. It's just like the man aboard the ship with Paul who could have thought, I don't believe that not one soul is going to be killed if there's going to be a shipwreck. Someone's going to die. That this man could be relaying to us the truth. However, Paul believed this message just as God had told it to him. And the event then came to pass to the T. You go back to the Old Testament to you know, what we call the father of faith, Abraham. When God told him, he gave him several promises, one of them being, you're going to bear a son in your old age. Oh, and by the way, his elderly wife, who was always barren, would be the one who would bear this child. She had never bore a child. So number one, Abraham would end up bearing a son at age 100. That was unheard of. Even at that time when they lived even much longer than we do, Sarah would be 90. 
after it was all said and done and the child was born. Then number two, Sarah had been barren her whole life. That's the other factor here. And now she's going to bear a son at the age of 90 years old. Romans chapter 4, and verse 19, it says about Abraham, but not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. Not talking about dead in the sense of he's dead, dead, but the dead, uh, well, this keeps going. It says since, since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb, they couldn't have children anymore. He did not waver at this promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Then, therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. And it says that throughout the scripture. Because he trusted God, all the promises, everything God told him, he believed and did what he needed to do. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So the Bible says very similar wording with how Paul felt about God's promises in, the new, in comparison to Abraham. Both were convinced that it would be just exactly as it had been told to them by God. If God said it's going to happen this way, then you better believe it's going to happen this way. For I believe God just exactly as it was told to me. And of course, there are many other examples that we could use of uh, Bible characters of faith who had this same believing mindset that we need to have today. Uh, but for the rest of this lesson, uh, let's think about different ways in which we can speak this same thing regarding what God has spoken to us today. Uh, so for the rest of this lesson, I'm going to go over that list that I gave you for the handout of 19 uh, quick examples we'll go through. We're going to cover this whole thing tonight, so each one won't be super long. By which faithful, believing Christians today should have the same attitude as Paul and Abraham. I believe God just exactly as it was told to me. Now, so number one, let's reach backwards into the past first before we reach forward into future promises for us. Uh, at what some would call hard to believe words of God. So number one, I believe God that he created the universe just as it's written in scripture. There are many in this world who read the creation story and do not believe it's possible that a God started everything that we see and know today. Starting with athe atheists, uh, they say that it's something we can't prove that an unseen God caused everything to come about from nothing. Only thing is, even scientists nowadays say that they believe the universe did have an origin. That is, it, it wasn't here forever. So there was a point in which there was absolutely nothing physical. No physical universe, no material universe, but the big question they can't answer is, well then, if you're only complying with natural phenomenon, which that's what they claim, oh, you have to answer everything with only nature itself, how did we then get everything that we see and know? They say, well, we don't know, but it could not have been God because the idea of a God doesn't fit inside the physical laws of nature. However, that is precisely the what the evidence points to in the beginning. Uh, something not working in compliance with the natural laws. Some supernatural event causing the universe to begin. And the evidence points to that. And they, they call it the Big Bang. Uh, they, they call it random chance. And we call it God. We understand. And they say that nothing, nothing can go against the laws of nature. Miracles don't fit into this. And I've heard it said, you have to allow, basically if an atheist is uh, going to, speak by only naturalistic ways, you have to allow them one miracle. And that was at the beginning. And then other than that, no miracles. Uh, with either model, creation model or the, the evolutionary model, the evidence shows that something acted supernaturally in the beginning to generate the material universe. Something acted outside of the normal ways of, of the laws of nature. Thus, in the beginning, the supernatural God, all-powerful and omnipotent, creating the heavens and the earth, makes far more sense than nothing created everything out of nothing. A supernatural cause aligns with the evidence, actually. So, number one, I believe God that he told us that it was he who created the universe. And he's communicated to us how he did it. Which brings us to point number two. 
adding on to this, I believe God that He created everything in six literal days, just like He told us He did. Uh, If the God of heaven has spoken to mankind and told us, hey, in the beginning, here's how I did it. Here's exactly how I did it. Here is the way the creation week went down. Then why would we humans shake our heads and say, uh, this biblical description of creation does not make sense to me? Someone says, I, I don't believe in the six day creation model. I, I believe, you know, I think God created it through millions and billions of years. Uh, I just don't think it lines up with, with, with science, they say. However, if we're talking about a God, listen, working supernaturally, outside of the natural law in the first place, then he reveals to us, yes, over the course of six literal days, I created the heavens and the earth. Then why would we have trouble believing God's words? If we're going to choose to believe in a supernatural God to which the evidence points, then why would a God working outside the laws of nature not be able to create everything within a six-day framework? That's the definition of God to have the capability of doing supernatural things. That's what we're talking about. That's what the evidence points to. In fact, the Godhead could have performed the creation in only one day, or even in one minute, or one moment. God only revealed to us that he did it spread throughout six days to give us a framework so that we could measure time, because he was creating time at the same time as this. So in the creation week, he set up the seven-day week. You ever ask atheists, where did the seven-day week come from? They can't answer that either. But it's by which we keep track of our time. Ever since the creation, we've all had a seven-day week. And on day four, remember God created the, the sun, the moon, the stars. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, God said, Let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and for years. So in the first week of the material universe, God purposefully set up a framework by which we could then tell time using the sun, the spin of the earth, and the moon and the star. So yes, number one, I believe God created everything. Number two, that he created everything in six literal days, just like he said, ceasing the creation on the seventh day, just as he told us. Why would this be so impossible to believe uh, with the living God? Now, number three. Number three, then, in dealing with interactions with this uh, all-powerful God, I believe God, about all the amazing occurrences in Scripture. For this point, consider the biblical accounts. Some people of the world would call fables or fairy tales. A lot of times it's what we start with with our kids' stories. But the Bible writes about these occurrences in all seriousness as real events. These are not uh, described to us as as folklore, fairy tales, but it's involving the supernatural God and his workings with mankind. In the book of Genesis, we can read about Noah's flood. In the book of Joshua, you can read about the battle of Jericho. There's the story of David and Goliath, the little shepherd boy who trusted in God, and God providentially allowed him to defeat the giant Philistine, Goliath. I believe that occurred to the T. I don't think that's just a child's fairy tale. That is a true story. I also believe that some of uh, some what we call the fictitious story of Jonah and the belly of the big fish, I believe that story. I believe it happened just the way it said it did. I believe the story of Daniel and the lion's den. You might remember the battle uh, in Joshua chapter 10 when God caused the sun to stand still so that the Israelites could finish their victory. Or in Hezekiah's day, you might remember when God performed a sign in moving the sundial 10 degrees backward. Hezekiah was offered a choice. The shadow on the sundial could either go 10 degrees backwards or 10 degrees forward as a sign from God, and God would perform it. Hezekiah chose that he wanted to see it go backwards, and God made it happen. Now, we talked about this before. Uh, it seems unfathomable to us but that this would involve all of the heavenly bodies that have been set in motion by God to then come to a stop and move backwards slightly. You understand how much that entailed? It would involve the earth that had been spinning on its axis all these years to cease spinning. It would involve the earth spiraling around the sun to stop for a moment and move 
backwards, spin backwards, 10 degrees, just as God had said. But this was nothing to the all-powerful God. That's the definition of an all-powerful God. God showed in these awesome stories that he truly can do anything that's within his will to do. If he wishes to do it, he can, it can be done. I believe with our all-powerful God in the picture that all these occurrences happen just as God described them to us. Then number four, I believe God about all the miracles of times past, the ten plagues in the book of Exodus, uh, the Red Sea crossing. It's an awesome story when you stop and think about that one. The manna from heaven that fed the Israelites all those many years. How Israel's shoes never wore out as they walked through the wilderness all those years. The miracle of the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All of these occurrences involve the supernatural God reaching his hand down to the creation as he simply wished to speak to mankind and approve his message with a miracle as a stamp of approval. And then uh, you know, he simply performed these mighty feats. Uh, it's not difficult to believe then the occurrence of the virgin birth and the coming of Jesus. Not with God in the picture, a supernatural God. I believe the story to the T of Jesus walking on the water. It happened. Jesus healing the sick, raising the dead, and other such miracles. And yes, we affirm and we believe uh, Jesus was raised from the dead. One of the most powerful miracles to put God's stamp of approval on the person of Jesus. So again, it's just a funny argument to me uh, when people say, you really believe these fairy tales? You really believe that these outlandish stories actually happen to the T as they're written in this old book and that miracles occurred in this fashion? Now we say, if the supernatural God exists in the first place, then why is it thought to be so strange that he can act supernaturally if he wants to? Why is that hard to believe? Are you surprised that a supernatural God would do supernatural things? In Acts chapter 26 and verse 8, as Paul was reasoning with King Agrippa, I like one of the questions that he asked him. Paul said, this is our reasoning really, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? We're talking about God here. This is his creation in his universe. He created the laws of nature to begin with. Uh, is it anything for our God to suspend the natural laws which he created, to act in his own way that he would like to. No, I believe God and all of these occurrences that happen just as they were told to us. Number five, the first fundamental of the gospel, I believe God, that a member of the Godhead came down from heaven to be our sacrifice for sin. John chapter 1, verse 14. The passage talks about Jesus Christ and how he became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in that same chapter, in verse 29, John the baptizer announced, Behold, the Lamb of God. He's come to take away the sins of the world. Someone says, So you really think that God is comprised of three persons, and that one of those three came down to earth, put on flesh, and walked among men? I say, Yeah, that's exactly what I believe happened. Why is that story so unfathomable with the supernatural God in the picture? They say, and you think that the all-powerful God sending one of the three died on that cross to make atonement for man's sins? Makes perfect sense to me. I believe God just exactly as it was told to me. To the T, I believe God. I believe in the virgin birth, in the crucifixion and the trial before Pilate and Herod. Uh, this story is not made up. It has stood the test of time as well. It's God's story, how he wished to interact with mankind, hoping to offer us this eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's still available today. Number six, then, I also believe God, concerning the conditions of this new covenant. Some say, I don't believe God has certain laws and duties that he expects us to, to keep after sending Jesus. But hey, if you're going to read this Bible as the Word of God, then you have to take it as a package, a package deal. Okay, if you're, if you're going to buy into any of this message, then you have to buy into all of this message. You can't pick and choose what you want to believe. You can't have it both ways. 
You can't pick and choose parts of this book written by the inspiration of God and say, now this part, I don't wish to believe in this part, but this part I completely do. No, if you read God's word at face value, it contains every expectation for man on what we need to do to get to heaven, to comply with the grace system of God. Thus, uh, I'll go through this short list, all his sub points under point number six. I believe God, just as it was told to me in Scripture, that baptism saves, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. So many people are in a feud with the fact that baptism is the saving act prescribed to us by God. So many say, I just can't accept that. And I say, why? Why not? It was written by the inspiration of God. Why can't you believe it? I also believe, God, that faith, repentance, and confession are essential too. Uh, I believe that you have to trust in the living God, have a faith, have a belief, have a change of mind, that's your repentance, and then vocalize your faith, your trust in God by confessing that you believe Jesus Christ is the Savior. I read that these conditions are all things that God has given us to access this salvation. Now, I believe, God, that if I perform these acts through faith and trust in Him, then He'll give me exactly what He's promised to give me, the remission of my sins. So through hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized, I can have the access, access to the remission of sins. It's a very simple plan. Thirdly, I believe God that he will not accept all worship. Now, this is a hard one for people to believe. I don't think that. He's given us this principle from every generation before Christ in order to teach us how he accepted Abel's worship while rejecting Cain's. And he struck Nadab and Abihu dead for offering their strange fire, which he commanded them not. And oftentimes, God would reject worship. And then Jesus made it clear, worship will, that will be accepted must be offered to God in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verse 24. And that's an a important study. Here's another uh, thing in like manner. I also believe God that he won't accept all religious setups and practices. He taught us to follow the pattern of Jesus being the head of the church, Jesus being the sole authority over the teachings, the doctrine, and the worship of the church. Then elders oversee the local congregation. I believe, God, that those who go about designing their own churches with their own systems of authority that's different from this and different types of leadership setups, uh, teaching heresy and causing dissension, I believe that God will not accept just any old religion because that's what the Bible teaches. We have to adhere to his religion and follow things the way he's told us to do it. Jude chapter 1 verse 3 told Christians to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So I believe that. In this same category, I also believe, God, that our daily faithfulness will be judged on the judgment day. There are conditions to this uh, covenant. First Peter chapter 1, verse 17 says, And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. I believe, God, that the way we live does matter. I believe, God, that complying to his laws is part of the process of being found faithful under the new covenant. Then here's another one. I believe, God, that the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19-21. He told us about many sins. And if we will not turn from them, they will cause us to go to hell. We will not inherit the kingdom of God if we won't repent. Paul said those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you believe God on these things? Many people are going to act like they're so surprised on the judgment day when these things come to pass. And they'll say, I told you. I told you to the T what things wouldn't enter heaven and what things would. Many people don't wish to comply with the standard, standard and they remain in denial. They say, Oh, you know, God won't judge me for these things. I can continue in this wicked practice, violating the things that God told me not to morally. I'll still go to heaven because I believe in Jesus. But I say, are you willing to place yourself at odds with the words of the living God? 
Do you not believe God? Just as it was told to you? Many make our God out to be a liar if they think even though He's spoken in these areas, He's still going to let us through if we don't comply. After He's already stated what He's going to do, many people act like, well, He might not. God's spoken. God cannot lie. And lastly for this section, I believe God also that constant unyielding sin will not inherit heaven, will not enter heaven. It's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. So no, uh, we, we can't sin more and more that grace may abound, Romans 6, 1. We can't sin willfully as a way of life, walking in darkness, 1 John 1, 6. God has revealed to us, if, if you won't turn from your sin, you will not enter in. You have, have, you have to have a different course of life to qualify for this. Um, and I don't know about you, but I believe God about all these things just exactly the way He's described it to us. And the Bible teaches that it's called heresy and dissension to divide, changing these uh, doctrines. Uh, number seven, how about this one? Keep going. I believe God, this is a hard one for people to believe, that few will make it to heaven and that the majority will go to hell. It's a hard one for people to wrap their heads around. That They say, oh, I, I affirm that I believe this. Jesus' words, not mine. Okay, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he said, you need to enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are, listen, many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are, listen again, few who find it. Jesus talked about the many versus the few, the narrow path versus the broad path. So now, will you choose to hear the truth on this matter? Many hear this concept and they say, you've got to be kidding me. You believe that? I don't believe this can be true. I think most people are going to heaven. They're good people. And I don't believe most people will end up in hell. That's the thought most people probably. But to them, I refer to them to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. You think you know better than God? Where to put people? heaven or hell, and all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your path. Uh, stop coming up with your own belief system and your own ideas for the way you believe things will end up. The only thing we know is what God told us. He's the judge through Jesus Christ. And through the all-powerful God, the supernatural and omniscient God, He's told us the way that it will be to the T. Most of mankind will not be going to heaven after this life is over. So that's a hard truth for people to swallow, and that's why we need to gird up the loins of our mind and be ready to give an answer uh, to God and be ready to face God. So I believe God just as it was told to me. Number eight, I believe God that every religious organization not planted by Him will be uprooted. Matthew 15, 13. And that's the way Jesus worded it. Every plant which my Heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Uh, you, you know, mankind just can't start their own churches and be right with God. Uh, God has told us that's not going to work. That's not the way it's going to work. God established one church. Uh, he did so in sending His Son, one organization, and that church had one fundamental faith. It was one fundamental faith, one fundamental doctrine, and every other setup was started by man. There's only one original doctrine. You just got to read the Bible and figure out which one it is. And that's essentially number nine. I believe God, that He planted only one church to hold all the saved and that all other groups were started by man. It's the God-given truth. Colossians 1.18 says that the Lord's body is the church. Ephesians 4.4 4 says that there is one body, thus one church. And there is just uh, no way around the one church teaching of the New Testament. That if you want to walk away from here and say, I believe God, many people wish to second guess God. They say, well, I, I can be a part of this Christian breakaway group started by man that was started hundreds of years later. But you can't say that and truly believe God. I'm okay to be part of the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, or Methodist Church. 
All the while, Jesus said, all other organizations besides mine will be uprooted in the day of judgment. It's only one church. So what that means across the board for all humanity is this. Either you get in the church of Christ or be condemned forever. It's the ark of safety, just like Noah's day. I believe, God, that there is one realm of safety within Jesus Christ and His one true church. Now, now number 10, I believe, God, that we must speak the same thing. 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul wrote to Christians worldwide, Now, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I believe God that he was serious about that command and that it can be attained only if we speak what the Bible says alone and the authority that we get from Scripture. Number 11, I believe God that Jesus will come back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy 1.8. God said it. God said, you, you, you've got to come to know me, number one, and you've got to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, number two. And obeying the gospel, of course, consists of obeying the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus as we often study through repentance, baptism, and then faithfulness. So if those two things cannot be said of you, that you know God and that you have obeyed and are obeying the gospel, you will not enter in if you don't have a check mark in those two boxes. I love summary statements, and that's a good passage as a summary statement. Everybody going to heaven knows God and obeys the gospel. That's the only way you get in. Uh, so yes, I believe this verse just exactly as it's written. Number 12, now coming from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. I believe, God, that the heavens will pass away. Now we're reaching forward into the future, right? The heavens will pass away with a great noise, and that the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. So I believe, God, that this world is only temporary. That's what he's told us. And it's going to be destroyed. He's the one who brought it into existence. He's the one who's going to take it out of existence. Uh, then number 13. I believe, God, that all of mankind will stand before Jesus on the judgment day and be judged. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Matthew 5.32 says all nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. So I believe in the reality of the judgment day. Number 14, I believe God that heaven and hell are eternal. Matthew chapter 25 verse 46. They'll keep going on forever and ever and ever. You understand the word eternal. The same passage that says heaven is eternal which people like to believe that part, also says that hell is everlasting. That's the same Greek word. Many people love to believe in an eternal heaven, but they do not want to believe in an eternal hell. Uh, we're all going to one or the other. And I believe that, just as it was told to me by God through the Scripture. Number 15, I believe God, and this one's hard too, that good people will go to hell because they never obeyed the gospel. Of course, they are, you know, quote, good by our standard of goodness, not God's. Humanity would call them good. You might call the, the friendly old lady down the street, so to speak, a, a good person. But the Bible says none stands as good, truly, before God. No, not one. All are in need of the gospel system of grace and forgiveness. And without it, a person will be lost, uh, no matter how kind they were. No matter what type of a person you thought they were, they have sinned and they fall short of the glory of God. Number 16, I believe God that it is truly impossible for him to tell a lie. Hebrews 8 and verse 16. And, and this is an important one for our discussion because if you realize that it is impossible for our God to tell us a lie, then all these items we just talked about are entirely true. He's not kidding. It's not impossible for him to lie about these things. We say, I don't know about the one church concept and that everybody's got to come through the church. God can't lie. All right, it will be just as God explained to you and me because it's not within his nature to lie. 
Number 17, coming from Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I believe God that the gospel system is his only power to save man's soul. And souls. The presentation of the gospel, God says, is the only way to bring about the salvation of a person's soul. They've got to come in contact with the gospel. You must present them with the gospel. Number 18, and yes, in the face of all these harsh words that people laugh at, are also words that will end with uh, some comfort and some hope. I believe God, that he is a gracious and merciful God. Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2, Isaiah 55 and verse 7. He's not. He doesn't want to send us to hell. That's not his nature to desire uh, this punishment. He set up this whole system so we wouldn't have to be punished. Jonah said to God, Jonah 4, 2, For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, an abundant loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. And Jonah's an interesting character because he was going to preach this message to a group of people he personally did not want to be forgiven. And his problem with going to the people of Nineveh is he said, I don't want to go preach to them because if they repent, I know God will forgive them and then they won't get their punishment that they deserve. And so Jonah knew who God was. He is one who relents from doing harm. And so the point is, the, the, the system of grace that we have access to today is readily available. Even though God is very serious about sin, He's also very serious about forgiving your sin. If you'll just comply with this simple gospel system, keep you continually cleansed by following it through faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. You trust this system. You trust what God set up. You will be saved. But you've got to have faith. Faith which leads you to follow exactly what he told you to do. It's a system of faith. So if you'll accept the conditions of his grace, he will gladly and abundantly pardon you. So lastly, number 19, to bring things full circle on this, uh, going back to the title, what is it that I believe? I believe God. That really, with everything, that it will be just as it was told to me. God who cannot lie told us all these things. He gave us this truth set up he set it up to, to set us free, to inform us, to prepare us. And he also gave us this truth so, so that we could go out and share it to other people. And our duty, if we believe God, is to take these words by faith and pursue them with all of our might and present them to other people. Romans chapter 4 and verse 3 gives us Abraham as our example of trusting God. It said, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He set up a system that, that Abraham could be justified through this. He said, if, if you will do these things, I'll justify you. And he trusted God, and he obeyed with his faith. The faith led him to obey. You go to the book of James, it talks about his works, played a part in this, that, uh, that he didn't work to get the offer of salvation, but he worked once God offered him the salvation, and that was part of the condition. So like Abraham, we have to trust. And we have to believe every piece of information that God has given to us, hold to it, put our hope in it, and then obey God like Abraham did. And if we affirm that we have believed these things, we can be accredited righteous too. We're believing God's way and obeying. Uh, so that's our lesson for tonight. I believe God just as it was told to me. Uh, so if you're not in a saved condition tonight, the Bible says enter into Christ's fold and stay there until the day you die, live faithfully. But to do that, you've got to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. We can talk all about that afterwards if you need to. Enter in, remain faithful until death. If you slip up into sin, you know the second law of pardon, to pray, repent, and confess that sin. And just keep that windshield wiper of faith keeping you clean by the blood of Christ that you gained at your baptism. Uh, and you will go to heaven. Get that crown of life. I believe God just as it was told to me. Um, if you have any need, come while we stand and sing.